In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one God. Amen. Dear ones, today I bring you the second edition of Saint Spotlight, uh, in which I will talk about one of the most influential figures in my life and one of the most important saints, one of my absolute favorite saints, Saint Nectarios of Aegina. Before talking about the life of Saint Nectarios directly, I want to share a personal story of why St. Nectarius is so important to myself and, and my family. When I was in college, uh, in undergrad, this is when I, I really began to explore what I really believed. Uh, at the time, I was studying political science, and so what I really wanted to find out was why do I believe what I believe? I realized that very few people can answer that question, myself included. And so I began taking more and more classes, not on in political science, but in philosophy. And in the course of this, uh, I took a class entitled The Philosophy of St. Augustine. It wasn't the theology, but the philosophy of St. Augustine. It was actually taught by an Orthodox Christian professor. And in reading the Confessions of St. Augustine, I began to realize that much of my beliefs were shaped by my Christian faith. And if that's the case, I better find out what my Christian faith actually is. I grew up Lutheran. My family became Orthodox. I was at a Catholic university. What am I? Am I really an Orthodox Christian? So I decided that it would be important for me to really look into my own faith and maybe start taking it a little bit more seriously. During this time, one night I was, I was doing some homework and a memory came to me of a saint who, when he had died uh, in a hospital, the nurses began preparing his body. They took his robe or sweater off of him, put him on the, on the bed next to him, and in that bed was a paralytic. And when that sweater touched the paralytic, he could feel his legs, and within an hour he was up and walking and saying, this guy is clearly a saint. But when this memory came to me, I, A, had no idea who it was. B, I hadn't thought of this since I first heard the story probably six or seven years prior. And C, there was something about the story that was almost forcibly pushed into my mind. I can't really describe the experience. I will tell you that it came out of the blue, and I remember trying to do homework and not being able to focus whatsoever. I couldn't get rid of this, this memory. And so I went on to a much uh, younger Google and began searching uh, the words, you know, miracle, saint, orthodox, paralytic. Uh, and I spent probably hours looking and I could not figure out who this was. Eventually, I was able to calm my mind enough that I could go back to sleep or go to sleep. And a couple nights later, the same thing happened. I was doing homework. This memory was just forced into my, my mind. I could not do any homework whatsoever. And I had to find out who this was. I just had to. I, I can't describe the experience, but I had to. And this was the night that I discovered St. Nectarios. And when I saw that St. Nectarius had reposed in the year 1920, uh, this was well before the year 2020, and so I thought, my goodness, I didn't think figures like this existed within the last 100 years. Uh, St. Nectarius was known for being a wonder worker, not just after his life, but during his life. And the little that I could find online about him astounded me. I couldn't believe what I was reading. I, I thought figures like this St. Basil, St. John Chrysostom. I thought these people lived 1,000, 1,500 years ago. I had no idea figures like this existed within our own times. And I began to think, well, if he less, lived less than 100 years ago, then certainly we have accounts of people who knew him who lived many years after him. And I couldn't find any evidence of, of accounts of people who said, you know, this man was nothing special. Everybody who knew him said this was, you know, an incredible man of great virtue, great prayer. And I realized that I better start taking my faith a lot more seriously. That's when my bookshelves, uh, one by one, books were thrown away about politics. And I started buying Orthodox books. The Way of the Pilgrim, Mountain of Silence, Father Arseni. Those were the first three that I read. Uh, and I started to become very interested in my faith, and especially in the concept of modern saints. I had no idea that there were saints who lived during my own lifetime. I, you know, then discovered St. John of San Francisco, St. Uh, Paisios of Mandathos. At the time, he wasn't saint yet. Uh, Elder, or Elder um, Porfirios, now St. Porfirios of Causcalivia. 
so Saint Nectarios had had become the the door through which you know modern saints became a reality for me, and suddenly now prayer became important for me, fasting became important for me, and I started to actually engage with my faith in a living way rather than just say I'm Orthodox and I go to church every Sunday but not really have it affect my day to day life. That uh, that occurred in the fall semester. And so for Christmas, I discovered that uh, there was a life of St. Nectarius written in English. And so I asked for it for Christmas, and I asked for an icon of St. Nectarius. My, my dad got me the life of St. Nectarius and the icon of St. Nectarius for Christmas. Um, perhaps uh, now rather funnily, um, I had asked for a particular icon of St. Nectarius I found uh, online. Um, I wanted one with uh, with silver and, and uh, gold intermixed in it, but that one was rather expensive. So I said, well, well just get me the silver one. But uh, we, we both thought that the measurements were in inches and it turns out they were in centimeters. And so I got this very small icon of St. Nectarius, uh, which I still have to this day. This is the very one. Um, and even though it was small, uh, it was still very significant to me and remains significant. This typically sits in my office at church. Um, and uh, I have a great love for this icon. I've never been able to find the one, again, with the, uh, the, the, the gold, you know, it had it in the halo on his hand and a couple other places on the crosses. Um, I've never been able to find that one, but it, it's okay. Uh, I have a lot of icons of St. Nectarius, and in this video, um, in a minute, I will uh, show quite a few of them. So this was the, the icon of St. Nectarius that I received. In addition to this, this icon, I also received the life of St. Nectarios. It was a different version of it at the time, um, but uh, I've since given that one away. It's St. Nectarios, the Saint of Our Century. I think that one was called a Saint for Our Times. It's the same book by Sotos Kondropoulos. A couple days after Christmas, I was reading this life. I was really consuming it <laughs> and, and go, going through it quickly. Now, a strange part of the story is a few days before this, I was at uh, Barnes and Noble with uh, with some of my family and my sister, seeing that I was becoming very interested in my faith, and I was looking um, at the time Barnes and Noble actually sold a couple of the volumes of the Philokalia, and so uh, looking for this, she said, "I swear one day you'll become a priest." And I looked at her and I said, "I will never become a priest. I feel no calling for that whatsoever. No one's ever said that I should become a priest. That will never happen." Just a few days later, I'm reading this life of Saint Nectarios. And this kind of interesting uh, exchange occurs between St. Nectarios and his, uh, his assistant, who kind of worked as, as his uh, treasurer and secretary. And during this exchange, St. Nectarios begins asking uh, Costa, is his name, what he's going to do with his life. And so this is the exchange that occurs. While Costa is uh, concerned um, about the, uh, the lack of funds for the monastery that St. That Nectarius is, is hoping to uh, rebuild, St. Nectarius says, Don't let such things preoccupy you, Costas. God will provide, and that I know wholeheartedly from my experiences. No true spiritual work is achieved by money or depending on human abilities. Costas replied, And what about your health? St. Nectarius wrote, that also will get better. If the Lord so wills the establishment of this convent, then he will give me my health, my health and anything else that I need, or that is needed. So Costas replies, how will you manage both here and there? He was at the Rosarius Ecclesiastical School. We'll talk about that in a second. Nectarius smiled, spread out his arms, and moved about. How long, Costas, will I teach? I will retire soon, and then finally become the ascetic I have always wanted to be. Surely you must remember that I told you of this desire four years ago. Costas blushed and nodded. His eyes teared. What will happen to me, your, your eminence? Where will I be without your holiness? I will be lost, and they will throw me out of Rosarios. And then... Costas, St. Nectarius replied, you must remember that you still have a family and obligations, as you yourself have said many times. Why don't you become a priest, my dear boy? A long pause followed Nectarius' suggestion. Already St. Nectarius had interceded for me in making me, causing me, I should say, to take my faith more seriously. When I read that line, why don't you become a priest? I can't describe the experience I had, but I heard 
St. Nectarius. Not audibly, but I heard him in my heart. Uh, the voice was clearer than words spoken to you. I, I can't describe it. I remember I was, I was lying in bed reading this, and I, I put the book down when I read that line, and I, I had that, that very strange experience. And I felt such peace. This, this should be a life-shattering decision, a, a life-changing moment. But there was such peace that I sat there for just a few seconds. And I nodded and I said, okay, okay. If that's what the Lord wants for me, then through the prayers of St. Nectarius, guide me towards that. If not, hinder me, if this is a mistake. And then I just kept reading. <laughs> and, uh, uh, the fact that I kept reading, uh, I, I, I mentioned it to explain how much peace I had at this, at this, this sudden change. So St. Nectarius, I credit as the reason that I began really paying attention to my faith in the first place, and he is the reason I became a priest. And so I promised St. Nectarius that if, if that were to occur, then in gratitude to him, if the first child I had was a son, and I, I asked him, you know, give me a son first because I want to name him after you. And so my, my oldest son is indeed named Nectarius uh, because of his great intercessions in my life. Because of this, uh, saint Nectarius is the saint of whom I have, obviously, besides Christ and the Panagia, uh, there's there's no figure I have more icons of than saint Nectarius. And so while I begin the life of saint Nectarius, I'll show you some of the icons I have of him, uh, beginning first with, with this one, which I purchased at saint Nectarius Monastery in Roscoe, New York. Uh, saint Nectarius Greek Orthodox Monastery, there's a beautiful monastery, some of the most beautiful iconography I've ever seen is in the refectory and uh this this icon was was purchased there it's been been a great treasure of uh, of mine so uh what i wish to do with this video uh is to not only tell you about the life of saint nectarius um but tell you probably a few things you may not know about him tell you where to begin with his his writings um and uh and then at the end uh i have uh i have a little bit of a a, a beautiful uh, and exciting at least for me a announcement about what i'm going to do and put out next week uh, because it's uh, it's an answer to a question I've had for a, a great deal of time. And so first, the life of, of St. Nectarius, as I show some of the icons that I have, and then eventually I'll show some, some other icons that can be found online. St. Nectarius was born Anastasius Kefalas on October 1st, 1846 in Thrace, which is in modern day Turkey. He attended elementary school, but had no secondary school to attend. But he wished to be much better educated because he really wanted to serve the Lord and he wanted to preach the gospel. He wanted to teach people, much like St. Cosmas at Delos. He, he had a great burning desire to be a teacher and to instruct people in the faith. At the age of 14, due to his family's poverty, he decided to go to Constantinople to find work to help financially support his family. So he went to the local dock, he found a ship, and he talked to the captain, and he told the captain that he didn't have any money for a ticket for fare. And the captain told him, if you don't have any money, get off the boat. And so Anastasius went and he sat sadly on the dock, wondering what to do. Well, when the ship was ready to leave, the captain ordered that the ship's engines begin, and the propellers began moving, but the ship would not move itself. It just stayed still. They tried to figure out what was wrong, and after, after uh, quite a few attempts, finally some of the crew saw Anastasius and convinced the captain to allow him on board. They thought, maybe, maybe this is a divine intervention. And sure enough, Anastasius was welcomed on board, and immediately the ship began to move. He found a job at a tobacco factory, but the, uh, the owner of the tobacco factory, his boss, was, was very unkind to him, and, and he barely paid him enough to survive. Uh, Anastasius would walk around in ragged clothes, and he certainly couldn't send much to his family, which was the whole purpose for doing this. In desperation, when he was emaciated, had eaten very little, his clothes were falling off of him, in his holy simplicity, he decided to write a letter to Christ, to just write a letter directly to Jesus, and to ask him for help. And so he wrote this letter, and he was about to send it out, and he's walking down the street, and a merchant who happened to have a shop right across the street from the tobacco factory, he stopped him and in inquired as to what he was doing. Well, Anastasius explained that he had written this letter to Christ asking for help, and the man said, well, let me 
let me take the letter and I'll, I'll mail it for you. That man read the letter and seeing the poor state he was in, anonymously, anonymously he sent Anastasius money for clothing and food. So when Anastasius showed up at his job with new clothes, thanking Christ for his quick intercessions, his boss assumed that he had been stealing from him. He thought this is the only way that he could afford such nice clothing. And he was about to beat him. But again, by the providence of God, this merchant from across the street who had helped him already, he heard. He heard Anastasius being yelled at and about to be beaten. And he discreetly took Anastasius's boss aside and explained the situation to him and saved him from this beating. St. Nectarius at that age would go on pilgrimage when he got the chance. In one case, the ship on way to pilgrimage hit some tumultuous waters. He had a cross that he wore around his neck that had a piece of the true cross within it that his grandmother had given him. And so during these, this storm, he dipped the cross into the waters and the storm ceased. But in the process, he lost the cross. When they arrived at their destination, he was very, very upset about this. But the crew heard a knocking at the hull of the ship, and they were curious as to what it was. When they went to check it out, they discovered the cross was right there, and he, he retrieved it back. At the age of 20, Anastasios uh, left his, his job at the tobacco factory. I forgot to mention, by the way, one of the things he would do at the tobacco factory, he kept a, a journal with him where he would write down scriptures and sayings of the Holy Fathers, of the saints, that he especially, especially found, found inspirational and moving. And so as part of his, his uh, desire to teach and, and preach the gospel, he would write sayings on these little strips of paper and put them in the packaging with, with the tobacco and send them out. And this was his little ministry. But he still really wanted to teach. And so at the age of 20, Anastasius went to Chios, where he became a teacher. And it said that he only knew two roads well, that to his job at the school and that to the church. And he spent most of his time at the church. During this time, though, he also discovered a local monastery, the Monastery of the Holy Fathers. And he began to visit there frequently and asked the abbot, St. Pocomius of Chios, to be his spiritual father. St. Pocomius of Chios became his instructor, and not only the instructor of St. Nectarius, but also of St. Anthemus of Hios. Uh, St. Anthemus of Hios, maybe you, you don't know him, but if you know St. Nikiforus the leper, St. Anthemus of Hios was his spiritual father. And so you see this lineage uh, that occurred. After about seven years of ser serving as a teacher, Anastasius entered the monastery of Neomoni. After three years, he was tonsured with the name Lazarus. He would pray and fast very strictly, Often he would keep vigil the entire night in prayer, depriving himself completely of sleep, not sleeping at all. After another two years, he was ordained a deacon and he was given the name Nectarius. During this time, uh, St. Pocomius instructed him in virtue and especially in prayer. And this is when St. Nectarius really took on the practice of Jesus' prayer. St. Pocomius encouraged this new deacon, Nectarius, to further his studies and so St. Nectarius went to Athens to further his education. He also traveled to Alexandria, where Patriarch Sophronius uh, began to get to know him. And he saw Nectarius's brilliance and piety, and he continued to encourage and support him. And so in 1885, around the age of 39, St. Nectarius arrived in Alexandria, where he was ordained a priest and then a bishop, becoming the Metropolitan of Pentapolis. The people greatly loved St. Nectarius. He was incredibly pastoral, compassionate, and merciful. He instructed clearly and precisely, always from the Holy Fathers in his own experience. He had zero attachment to money. People were shocked at the little attachment he had to money. They would see that he had no money to support himself, and they would give him money. And within seconds, he had given it to some of the poor. And so the poor were very, very attracted to him and would spend a lot of time around him and just bask, not in just his money, but in his love. He continued to live very prayerfully and very ascetically. And the grace that he had was palpable to those around him. People loved to be around St. Nectarius because of the abundance of grace that flowed from his person. But this unfortunately raised the ire of many of the priests and bishops around him who saw his popularity and became quite jealous. And thus, sadly, through the influence of the devil, they began to spread rumors about him, just utter lies and slander, attacking his moral life, by claiming that he was living immorally with some of the women who he ministered to and accusing him of seeking uh, to usurp the throne of the Alexandrian Patriarchate. Now, Patriarch Sophronius, who was so close to St. Nectarius, 
he became convinced by people that St. Notarius' personal ambitions were true, and thus he suspended him from serving. St. Notarius was, was confused and so hurt by this sudden turn of events. When he saw that he was going to be offered no clarity, he wasn't even allowed to speak with the patriarch and find out what this was really about, and he had no way to serve the people, he chose himself to leave for Athens, hoping to avoid further consternation from his flock and confusion among the people. This was not a self-protective act, but it was an act to really protect the people who he served because they were so confused at what had happened and they were becoming upset. Unfortunately, though, the slanderers wrote letters to people all over Greece condemning St. Nectarius for his supposed immoral living and ethical amb unethical ambitions, and thus church authorities gave him no position and so he began, he continually looked for, for some sort of way to serve the church, and no one would allow it. At this point, St. Nectarius was renting a small room from a pious woman. He had very, very little money to pay her. And when he did have money, beggars would come and ask him for help, and so he would often give the little he had away. So what did he do? He would spend hours in tears and vigil. Uh, he would continually fast, make prostrations, and pray the Jesus prayer. And he would especially seek the aid of the Theotokos. His love for the, the Panagia was so great that it's said that at the mere mention of the name Panagia, his eyes would well up with tears. He had such an incredible love for her. Daily, he would go to the minister of religion to seek some way to serve the church, but he was frequently denied any position. He considered at this time going to Mount Athos and becoming just a, a simple monk there, uh, even though he was a metropolitan. But he still felt this great urge within him. He felt that his purpose was to teach. And so he decided to stay, despite the fact that it was so so painful for him and it cost him such hardships. With all these hardships, he saw that God had providentially allowed them. And so rather than complain and become embittered, he endured them. And he continually thanked the Lord and the Panagia for their grace. Eventually, a man he had known in Egypt providentially ran into him in Greece. The man was really shocked by what he saw. He saw this once glorious metropolitan in, 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 in a lowly state, living in a, this, this tiny room, barely with enough money to eat, with you know tattered robes. And this man, due to his own influence and wealth, was able to convince the minister of religion to give St. Nectarius at least the position of a preacher. Now, the position of a preacher was seen as a very, very lowly, uh, lowly position in the church. Uh, typically a priest, not definitely not a bishop, a priest would be given that task, especially if for whatever reason he couldn't handle his own parish, if I understand that right. And so this was unheard of for, for a metropolitan to be a, a, a preacher who would travel to churches and preach. But St. Nectarius was grateful for this, this offer and accepted it. But the slanders continued. People refused to listen to the life-giving preaching that came from his grace-filled lips. St. Nectarius feared scandalizing the people. And he wouldn't preach in his own defense. He would not give himself a defense whatsoever. So he said, if God has continued to allow this, I can't let my presence scandalize the people who think that I'm a hypocrite with everything I'm saying. And so he decided to resign this already lowly position. By this time, however, some who had given the Metropolitan a chance and had gotten to know him recognized that he was not just a virtuous person, but a holy person. And... Thus, they were able to use a little bit of influence to get him the position of the director of the Rosarius Ecclesiastical School. So though some of the students originally had uh, initially heard some of the scandalous rumors about their new director, St. Nectarius' very pious and prayerful demeanor in services, his grace-filled teachings, his example, his character swayed people to his support. And many of the students grew a great attachment to St. Nectarius because of this. Many were inspired to become a priest because of his example. And this sometimes caused issues with parents and other people who were supporting the school, thinking that he was unduly influencing them. You know, parents wanted their, their, their uh, young, young sons to be, you know, doctors and, and, and lawyers and, and something exalted. But just being around St. Nectarius, they realized that serving the church was a greatly exalted position. St. So Nectarius wasn't, uh, wasn't uh, trying to influence them, but rather his example alone was a light to these students. As director of the school, St. Nectarius wrote many manuals in the spiritual life. This is when a lot of his writing was done. 
uh, many of which have now been translated into English. We'll talk about that at the end of this. These books are, are for the most part, more academically written because they're meant to be uh, uh, um, instructions, uh, books, uh, instructional books and guides to the spiritual life and to uh, different aspects of church history and theology. But anyone who reads them closely will begin to see the wisdom and spirit-filled heart of St. Nectarius through the words. I'll make some recommendations at the end of this. St. Nectarius also continued to live in deep prayer and asceticism. When the students would misbehave, rather than punishing them, he would often punish himself. And this was horrific for some of the students because they saw how he kept vigil, how he continually did prostrations and fasted, and they thought, He's, he won't be able to take it. He's going to kill himself with all this asceticism. So he would take on lengthy and deep fasts for his students when they would misbehave. And of course, they just fell in love with him all the more for his sacrificial example. One famous story at this time was when the janitor of the school fell ill. The janitor feared losing his jaw because he was out sick. And so he forced himself to come and, and clean, but he was horrified that when he walked to the school, he opened up one of the bathrooms and he found St. Nectarios, a metropolitan of the church, on his hands and knees, cleaning the toilets himself with his own hands. This was far from the dignity of a bishop. And yet, St. Nectarius insisted on doing the work. And he made the man promise not to tell anyone as long as he lived. He said he wouldn't allow him to lose his job. And also, this is the job of the servants of the church, is to serve. And so, in St. Nectarius' mind, this was necessary for his humility. So, why would he be denied this holy work? Again, St. Nectarius continued his life of deep prayer. He was, in every way, a great hesychist. I think this is one of the things that we forget when looking at the life of St. Nectarius. A lot of people read the, the outward stories and some of the miraculous occurrences, and they, they, they forget that St. Nectarius was also a hesychist. He was a, a deep practitioner of the Jesus prayer. He really wished to remain hidden from the world, and so little is known about his, his personal spiritual life, but we get little glimpses and indications, and especially later on, when he decided that his, his job as, as, a, as a teacher of the church publicly was done, and he went to the monastery that he had founded, uh, there are indications at that time that confirm uh, that he never ceased his, his asceticism and lengthy vigils and, and confirm the, the truly angelic life that he, he was living. In character with the students, he was strict but gentle. He held everyone to high standards. He even had to be convinced when a new game called football or soccer was being played by the students that it was actually okay and did not interfere with their education and virtuous formation. However, personally, he was humble and full of love. The most pious Orthodox Christians loved him greatly, and people would flock to him. Still, with his hesychism, St. Nectarius, as we just mentioned, began to feel that his time in public teaching was coming to a close, and he began to desire more solitude. There, there were at that time a group of young virgins who had come to St. Nectarius and asked to guide them so that they could become nuns. And so, with these young virgins, he blessed them and found the ruins of a monastery to rebuild and populate on the island of, a of Aegina. And he told them that he would guide them initially through letters and eventually come and join them. In, in 1908, he did this. He officially resigned from the ecclesiastical school and he moved permanently to the monastery. From this point on, his virtue and the miraculous nature of his person began to become more widely known. People would come to him and be healed of various afflictions and disease, diseases through his prayers, and even those who were possessed would come to him, and immediately uh, the demons would leave in his presence. But still the enemy of mankind would not rest, and thus rumors began to spread, even here, that he was living immorally, even with the nuns. Not the rumors, but that he was living immorally with them. So an accusation spread that he was forcing the nuns to have relations with him and then have abortions, and that they would throw the aborted babies down the well. It's a, a horrifically sick accusation against such a holy man. These accusations were examined and found to have no merit, but still some felt justified in their hatred towards St. Nectarius till the end of his life. But he was known even then to never speak a word in his defense. He rather accepted all slander as the providence of God, and saw it as, as fitting for, for humility, 
and would not speak in his own defense. His humility was beyond human comprehension. It was There was nothing earthly about it. Uh, St. Sophroni of Essex talks about how, that there are different types of humility. There's an ascetic humility, but then there's a divine humility. And St. Nectarius had a divine humility. It was a humility given by grace from Christ. St. Nectarius's, Nectarius's virtue attracted many, and many other saints and holy elders and eldresses were born by his guidance. So there are many, many saints and uh, figures who, uh, though not officially glorified yet, are, are clearly saints who learned under his, under his guidance and his example. In one of the books I have about him, there's a two-volume set from uh, Cleopas Strangulis, uh, St. Nectarius of Pentapolis and the Island of Aegina, the Monastic Ideal. Volume 1 is The Later Life of the Saint and the Establishment of the Holy Trinity Convent. Volume 2 is, are the catechetical le uh, letters. Um, these letters, uh, they're, they're called catechetical, um, not because they're, they're uh, a general catechesis of the Orthodox faith, but they're his letters of instructions to the nuns. And many of them just deal with, with very, very practical things about, about the monastery. Um, he's constantly asking about the nuns' health. This was a, a great concern of his uh, frequently. Um, and and he, gets, he gets perturbed when the, uh, the woman he chose as abbess, Xenia, uh, would write him and not inform him of of who was healthy and who was sick. Um, he uh, he wrote about uh, about the um, uh, you know what to build where, what to plant where, where to get money, who was going to do what work, you know who to pay, um, uh, you know when when the church was being built, where to worship, things like that. But within that, there's also a lot of uh, instructions on on some spiritual topics, some beautiful ones. But in the first volume. Um, it has one of my favorite stories that's not very well known uh, in, about St. Nectarius. There are interviews in the uh, second half of this book with people who knew St. Nectarius, and they describe some of their experiences with him. And this is a story that has stuck with me ever since I read it, that I, I believe really explains the spiritual heights to which St. Nectarius had, had risen during his time at the monastery. This is an interview with, with Sister Thecla Ali, Ali Frangi uh, in 1978. Sister Thecla says, I lived in St. Nectarius's convent when St. Nectarius was alive, and I witnessed many miracles he performed. Now I will tell you about a nice miracle St. Nectarius worked. One day I was down in the kitchen, and fishermen from Aegina had come to sell us fish so we could cook for the sisters and the abbess. Cassiani was abbess then. And she told me, Thecla, go up to his eminence and ask him if we should buy the fish that the fishermen brought to cook today. I ran to St. Nectarius's room immediately. As soon as I entered St. Nectarius's dining room, I saw that he was in his room, and I witnessed something that amazed me. I saw St. Nectarius, and his feet weren't touching the ground. He was about a foot and a half above the floor and was standing on air with his arms outstretched in prayer toward the icon stand and the icon of the Theotokos, and his face had undergone a change. She had the face of a saint, or he had, excuse me, he had the face of a saint. When I saw this, I was moved. I did not speak to St. Nectarius to tell him about the fish. Instead, I turned back and went down to the kitchen and told the abbess, Abbess, his eminence is unable to give us an answer about buying the fish, because he was praying and I couldn't speak to him. It's all right. Buy the fish anyway, even if St. Nectarius doesn't know. She bought the fish and I cooked them and remained in the kitchen. That week it was my turn to do the cooking. When the fish was cooked, we took St. Nectarius's plate and brought him his food. He asked us, did you buy fish today? Sister Ephemia, who was serving him, said, yes, your eminence. Thecla came to ask you, but you were standing in prayer and she couldn't ask you so as not to interrupt your prayer. His eminence responded to Ephemia accordingly. Which sister was this? Ephemia answered, Sister Thecla, tell her to come here. I want to see her, his eminence said. Sister Ephemia went to the courtyard and called me, and I went up to where his eminence was, and he asked me, Thecla, did you come to ask me if you should buy fish? I answered, yes, your eminence. And why didn't you ask me? Because I saw that you were praying, and I didn't want to interrupt you. You did well, dear Thecla, not to interrupt me. Cassiani also did well to buy the fish, but Thecla, the fact that you saw me, what did you see? 
I saw you standing high up, two feet from the ground. You were standing upright, and your hands outstretched in prayer, and your face had undergone a transformation. It was like the face of a saint, and I was deeply moved, and I turned and left. I went down to the kitchen and told the abbess, and they cooked the fish. Then St. Nectarius told me, be very careful. Don't mention what you saw happen to me while I was praying to anyone. Why did the saint say this? Because he didn't want the people to give him honor and glory. And so he didn't want me to spread this story. However, when I went down to the kitchen and said his eminence was unable to answer us, many sisters heard me and the news spread throughout the convent. And then I stopped. That was it. I saw the saint with his hands outstretched to the Theotokos, his feet about a foot and a half above the ground, his face like the face of a saint, and I was amazed. I was greatly moved. It was an incredible story of uh, St. Nectarios, who was, when she says this face was like the face of a saint, it sounds to me like he was shining with the uncreated light and was floating in prayer. So this, this is St. Nectarios at the monastery. In 1920, after living an angelic life over a decade at the monastery, St. Nectarios was in severe pain from a disease of the bladder. His nuns had urged and convinced him to finally go to the hospital, something he, he argued against for some time. At the hospital, hunched in pain, he was given a small bed in a two-patient room, in a third-class room. When asking his name for the registry, the nurse assumed he was merely a monk. And when told that he was, in fact, a bishop, she laughed, believing it to be a joke. This, this old man in these tattered robes, there's nothing glorious about him. There's nothing that, that gives him a sign of being a bishop. This must be a joke. She had never seen such humility. After two months in pain and prayer in the hospital, St. Nectarios gave up his soul on the evening of November 8th, which is liturgically November 9th which is his feast day in 1920. His last, in his last words, he called out to Christ, who he witnessed coming to retrieve his soul. As I began my own story with, the nurses began to prepare his body, and two miraculous occurrences happened. The first is the one that I, I've said already. The sweater he wore was placed in the bed next to him in which a paralytic lied. When, when the sweater touched the man, he could feel his legs. Within an hour, he was up and walking, and he said, this man must be a saint. But there's a second thing that happened that many people don't know. And that's the other reason that he and the nurses began to say this man must have been a saint. When St. Nectarius reposed, the room was filled with this incredible fragrance. The doctors from all over the hospital would come out of their rooms to come investigate what this fragrance was because it had spread over the entire hospital. Even with the windows open, this fragrance remained such that for some time, even after his remo removing his body for days later, they could not even use the room. The fragrance was just too strong. His body was taken back to the monastery of Agina. Some years later, his relics were exhumed, and they were found to be wholly incorrupt. It said that uh, he looked like he had just fallen asleep, even years after his repose. At the time of the opening of his tomb, a fragrance also enveloped the monastery, and spread over much of the island of Aegina, uh, some distance even from the monastery. Uh, it said that, that people were, uh, were, who were traveling um, around the island began to smell this, this incredible fragrance, and many of them understood that it was coming from the monastery because his relics had been uncovered. His relics were then recovered, and 20 years after his, reposed, after his repose, they were unsealed again, and this time they revealed amber-hued bones. His, his relics were no longer incorrupt. One of the nuns was horrified by this. She, she lamented before God, how could God give us this incorrupt, these incorrupt relics? And now, now they're bones. Why did, the, why did they decompose? But St. Nectarius appeared to her in a dream. And he assured her that he himself asked for this to happen. He said, he said don't be upset. This was my request because I want my, bread, my bones to be spread all over the world so that uh, miracles can, can happen and, and, and people can come to faith. There is, in fact, in California, in Southern California, there is a, uh, a church that's the Shrine of St. Nectarius that has one of his ribs. And uh, I'm, I'm hoping in the next month or two to be able to speak with, with the priest and talk to him and film it about some of the miracles that have occurred because of that. Um, okay, three more things to get to. I know this is going to be a longer video, but St. Nectarius is, is worth it. Um, 
first, uh, I want to discuss the the movie, The Man uh, Man of God. Um, a lot of people ask me about that. They say, have you, have you seen this? Yes, I've seen it a few times. Um, and, and what my thoughts are on it. Uh, obviously, I think we need more movies about Orthodox saints. <laughs> there's, there's, no, there's no question about that. And it's, it's, uh, it's, it's perhaps not surprising that Hollywood doesn't make uh, movies about Orthodox saints. But when you read some of their lives, you sit there and think, how could you not? I mean, see, these are the most, the most harrowing, incredible stories you'll ever see. Uh, and St. Nectarius is certainly a worthy figure. My, my feelings on that movie are admittedly mixed. Uh, I love the fact that there's a movie about him to begin with. I love the fact that it, it spreads information about him and people have come to love him through that film. I think there are many things that the movie does very well. Um, I understand why the filmmakers did not show the more miraculous nature of his life. And he was, even during his lifetime, he was, he was recognized for being a wonder worker. I recognize that for the audience that this movie is probably for, besides the, the miracle at the end, the, the healing of the paralytic, um, I understand why, why those things weren't put in the movie, but I wish they would have been. I wish that, that, uh, that it would have been made clear, clear that those who spent time around him witnessed multiple healings, exorcisms, and other miracles. Um, even this type of thing with Fodrin and prayer. The other thing that about the movie that, that um, I wish had been done differently is uh, St. Nectarius, is, through much of that movie, seemed sullen. He seemed despondent or sad. And when you really get to know his personality, you find that although he was saddened by a lot of the slanders about him, he accepted all as the will of God, and he was just overcome by his own love. His, his, his love, his warmth, um, shone through, and he never allowed himself to become overly despondent in these things. In fact, uh, many people were upset on his behalf, and he would console them uh, constantly. And the movie touched on that a little bit, but I wish it would have shown that more. Uh, to show that he was actually a very joyful figure for that reason. So, uh, is it worth watching? Yes, it's worth owning. And uh, but I but in addition to that, I would read Saint Nectarius, the Saint of our Century, and read whatever materials you can on Saint Nectarius. Um, the other thing I would I would really recommend is getting the Acathus to Saint Nectarius. This is one that I printed out, so you won't find this exact um, you know uh, icon and setup, but uh, um, you can find the Acathus or Acathus, however you pronounce it, easily online. Um, and this is this is well worth um, having in, in your prayer corner. It's something I, I pray quite frequently because of St. Nectarius' great intercessions in my life. Um, as I said, many of his books are written, as I knock things over, written in a more academic uh, uh, style. And so many people are surprised. I know I was when I began reading him. And I thought I, I would be exhilarated by his writings. There are certain saints that you read that your heart's just on fire. And I found some of his not to be very exciting. <laughs> and uh, I decided, though, after a while, I really want to push myself. I, I, this saint has, has meant so much to me. I really want to push myself. And in doing so, in reading quite a few of his works, I have quite a few more to read. Um, I try to read at least two to, two to three a year of St. Nectarius's work. I discovered that when really reading them closely, you begin to discover his, his wisdom in his heart. And although he's writing it in a more academic style, he's writing essentially, you know, uh, manuals. Um, uh, when you read them carefully and cautiously, you begin to really uh, discover um, what wisdom he had and you really benefit from those works. Um, the one I'm reading right now is, is called On Care for the Soul. It's, it's one of the thinner volumes. Um, and uh, I just started it a couple days ago. Um, but already, uh, I mean, he's constantly quoting the saints. Um, he's constantly describing uh, the, the nature of, of uh, sin, of, of virtue, of repentance. And I'm already uh, really enjoying this particular work. The, there are two that I would, I would recommend uh, to people to read the most. And then there's a third that I think everyone should, should, everyone should have. The, the first one that, that really... Um, opened my, my eyes and my heart to, to what brilliance uh, is in these, these works is volume seven. It's the book, Know Thyself. And in Know Thyself, what St. Nectarius does is, this is not a book you're going to read quickly. It's, it's not a book you're going to read 40 pages at a time. He just simply goes through these, these various topics of uh, a, a righteous or unrighteous life. And you see this, these are short topics on divine faith in Christ, on divine faith in Christ, which is a gift of God on the bond between faith and knowledge and how faith precedes knowledge. I'll skip ahead here. Um, on superstition and the superstitions of man, he, on independence and moral freedom, 
the ways to become morally free, on foul language and the foul-mouthed man. And what he does is he describes he describes unrighteous behaviors and righteous behaviors and describes the character of the man who employs these things, either the unrighteous or the righteous, as a manual for the spiritual life. This has been one of the most significant of my life. I, I, uh, I didn't keep my notes in this one. Uh, rather, I bought it on Kindle as well, and I took I have many, many highlights. And it's a book where you have to read and say, where can I find myself? Where do I find myself in unrighteous things that I really need to work on? It? Where do I find myself lacking in righteous things that I need to acquire? This as a manual is, a, is just a great book to read just a few pages a day. Um, the other one I don't have here, I have it on my Kindle. It's uh, called Holy Memorials and the Soul After Death. Holy Memorials and the Soul After Death. I think it's volume 12, if I remember right. Um, and that's just a really beautiful book that talks about the benefit of prayers for the departed, on why we do that. Um, and uh, there's some really beautiful teachings. It's one of, when, when, when saints talk about salvation and you know who is going to be saved, it's a book that I found to be one of the most merciful and gentlest that I've ever read. There are some parts of it that are that are, are, are still tough and scary in a good way that drive us into repentance. But I was so moved by that book. Um, I, I quoted it quite a bit in, in homilies afterwards. The book that I think everyone should have is the Theotokarion of St. Antares of Egan. It's volume 15. The Theotokarion are his prayers and hymns to the Theotokos. Um, I've got my bookmark here because I read a little bit every day uh, and I just I, I go through the book <laughs> and when I get to the end I start over again and uh, I just do some of these these hymns for the Theotokos and his love for the Panagia was so incredibly powerful and so great uh, and and this book really gets to his heart of his love for the Theotokos and it makes makes you fall in love with the Theotokos and so this is one I would I would highly recommend. Finally I said at the end today I would present uh, I would present a uh, what I think is an exciting announcement. <laughs> At least for me, it is. Um, one of the questions I had about about Saint Nectarius's life for many years now, many many years, uh, in reading his letters to uh, the girl, the, this blind girl that he chose as abbess of his monastery, who was given the name Xenia was why he chose her. And I wanted to know more about her. I figured somebody who who recognized St. Nectarius's great example and followed it, and someone who was taught directly by him for many years, she must have been, there, there must have been something very special about her, especially considering she was blind. Uh, why did he choose her? And I've never really known the answer. And I discovered, uh, looking on Amazon one day, that volume 17 of St. Nectarius's writings are, are actually not by St. Nectarius. It is... Poems, Supplications, and Confessions of Yeradisa Xeni, or Xenia, the first abbess of St. Nectarius of Aegina. This is the blind nun who he chose. There's a picture of her. And she writes these poetic prayers, uh, which I've been reading through. And when I received this book, I opened it and saw that there's about a six-page biography of Yeradisa Xenia. And I, I read, I, I opened to a random place and I read two paragraphs and I, I literally, my eyes welled up. I, I began to weep at, at how beautiful it was. Uh, it, it's a short life. <laughs> it's a short, short six pages. And yet you really understand that Yorandisa Xenia was a figure who St. Nectarius chose with reason. <laughs> and she indeed followed his example. Uh, and so I contacted uh, the nun who uh, is in charge of the translations of these works. And I asked her in the abbess of that monastery for permission to read that life uh, on this channel. And so next week I will. Next week I'll, I'll put out a video reading the, the six-page life of Yorani Saxenia um, to share with you. Um, she also, uh, I'm very, very grateful for, gave me permission for any publication that comes from this, this monastery. Um, to uh, to read the, them uh, on my channel. And so I may do that uh, quite frequently. It's the Monastery of the Virgin Mary of Australia and Oceania. Oceania. Um, so it's in, in Australia, and uh, I, I'm very grateful for that permission. So next week I will talk about uh, Yodanda Saxenia and, and re have a short video uh, reading her, her life. Uh, and uh, God willing, God willing, uh, 
course, not my will. <laughs> if it's the will of Christ, God willing, she will uh, be numbered among the saints, uh, along with St. Nectarios, because of her virtuous life. So uh, this is, I know, a longer video, uh, but uh, I wanted to share with you so much about St. Nectarios, uh, his, his amazing heart for Christ and the Panagia, his incredible life of asceticism and virtue, uh, the fact that he never, he never took the involuntary suffering of the slander spread around him and the fact that he couldn't live the life that he had hoped for, he never took that as an excuse to not also push himself in his own virtues. And you'll see in the Theotokarion that when begging the prayers of the Theotokos, he he constantly says that he has nothing to offer. He says, I'm, my life has, there's, there's nothing that I can show to Christ and show him and say, Say, you know, count this in my favor. I have nothing, so I, I need your prayers. I mean, the, the immense humility that St. Nectarius had is, again, beyond human understanding and comprehension. So St. Nectarius, one of the most important figures uh, of my life. Uh, every day I face the fact that I do not live up to the call that he made towards me, but uh, I will never forget it. And I really pray that he intercedes for me constantly, and especially when my soul departs. May we all have the intercessions of this great Saint Nectarius of Aegina with us today and always. Amen.